Kevin, uh, one of the few things, I mean, uh, we all fly now very regularly, at least before the COVID hit. Uh, and it was a very common sight now to see, you know, pilots marching in and going to the cockpit. But we still don't know what is an average life of a pilot. And how was it for you? How was your typical day? How many hours a day would you fly? And what is the kind of regimen? Because uh, I've heard about, you know, uh, once you start flying, it's like a, uh, you know, never stop learning. And I've heard you also saying that. Uh, yeah. What does that imply? It would be great to know. Uh, uh, yeah. So it was a very uh, funny way in which I got into aviation. I didn't want to study. So I thought being a pilot, yeah. I wouldn't have to study. It was all freedom. It was all flying around and, you know, just enjoying life, having fun, feeling free like birds. Little did I know that every day of my life I would have to study because we have tests every six months. We have simulator sessions. We have our uh, medicals. Earlier, we used to have them every six months. Now, of course, we have them yearly. And beyond a certain age, also, it becomes six months. So every six months, there's some record and training going on. And, you know, we really have to be working very hard. So in terms of the flying hours, we can do, uh, it depends on what type of aircraft you are, what flight you're doing, how many crew are flying with you. Because if it is more than two, uh, a two, uh, person cockpit, I won't say two men, because now there's so many women who are flying. So if it's more than a two person cockpit, then the hours become longer. I see. And then they can go up to 18 to 19 hours of flying in a day, 24 mm -hmm. hours. And in a month, we can, yeah, in a week, we restrict it normally to 30 hours, in a month to 125 hours, and in a year, a thousand hours. So that's the total flying. Of course, it has to be regulated. It has to be, you know, with your weekly rest period. After so many hours, you get a particular uh, rest. Nice. And uh, life is actually quite hectic as an airline pilot. It was till COVID hit us because mm -hmm. in every airline, of course, you know, airlines are looking for profits nice. and they would like to utilize their pilots as much as they can. So mm -hmm. with giving the minimum amount of rest and, you know, and not encroaching into fatigue, mm -hmm. uh, they would like to utilize their pilots. So sometimes, you know, we do feel like commodities. We it does make one feel, uh, am I a commodity? But yes, that, that's the way everybody works, you know. In every uh, company, I think employees are supposed to work as much as and they're supposed to perform. So that's our life normally. We could fly approximately five days or six days in a week also. Sometimes mm -hmm. on the seventh day also, depending on your the beginning of the week, how you start it. Sure. One day, one day off in a week is a must. And uh, I've been doing, of course, long haul flights. The long haul flights mm -hmm. are typically, you know, three day, four day flights. If you go uh, ultra long, then it's a four day flight. With and then the time off is dependent on the flight that you've done on how mm -hmm. many time zones you've crossed. That's so it's nice. quite complicated. It's very, very complicated. But yes, you know, it's just like sitting in your car or sitting in the aeroplane when you see there are so many buttons and so many dials, you get used to it. So yes, it is a very complicated network of professionals working to keep the sky safe and to keep all the passengers happy in the flight. If that's, I think uh, the that answer really brings in the uh, sophistication of the job. Uh, uh, because I think, the, and uh, for us, the most visible part is that cockpit view that you get with so many dials and so many controls. And I heard you once talking about that uh, till about, 2005, 2007, you were always on the analog and that's how later on you went onto the glass. Uh, if you could tell us, the, the viewers, what does that mean? And uh, what did, uh, because if 2007 means you're well into your uh, career, right? I mean, you're uh, all, already spent about 20 years. So when it takes about learning something as drastic, uh, and one of the questions that has already come in, actually, there are four talks about, you know, Amin asks about how much has technology changed the actual meaning of a flight by a pilot. And, and one of the things I found fascinating was the whole shift from analog to glass. Uh, how was that shift? How challenging was it, um, uh, especially learning an, at a time in a career where you already spent more than 20 years? Oh, you know, learning is never difficult. Learning is never, ever difficult. Because we are in a profession where we have to evolve. Upskilling mm -hmm. is very, very important. And in a profession like aviation, 
it's perform or perish. So we have no choice. We have no choice, but we have to go forward. And over a period of so many years, I've had so many endorsements. And endorsement means, you know, like suppose for a lay person, you're driving earlier. They used to drive a Maruti. So a Maruti could be any type of Maruti car, you know. So That's we right. started off with the Maruti 800, Maruti 1000, Maruti Desire, Maruti yes. Swift. There's so many types of Marutis, you know. That's but right. if you can drive one car, you can drive any car, more or less. You know, but when we fly planes, it's very odd that when we fly a particular type of plane, normally we cannot fly another type of plane unless it's the cross crew qualification. For example, if I fly a Boeing aircraft, then maybe sometimes the airlines may allow you to fly a Boeing 787 as well as a Boeing 777. Of course, 777 is much bigger than the 787, but handling characteristics and mostly, you know, the operations point is quite similar. If I fly an Airbus type of aircraft from the Airbus company, then the Airbus 320 and the Airbus 330 or an Airbus 330 and an Airbus 340, you could fly interchange and fly either of these aircraft mm -hmm. or an Airbus 319, 20, 21 is normally what everybody flies all over the world. But of course, we didn't do that in Air India. We never did cross crew qualification, so we didn't do that. But uh, so, you know, you have to learn and unlearn, learn and unlearn. So if I flew the Fokker Friendship initially and then I went on to the 737, I had to forget that. I had to forget the past instantly because there's no point in remembering because you're just going to be comparing terms and figures and terminal and it's very very important i must stress the fact that it's very important to use the correct terminology mm -hmm. when uh, we fly because any wrong terminology especially at the time of you know a critical moment will not help you will only make matters worse so it's very important to forget what you've learned unlearn and then learn the new thing and then carry on so it's not really difficult but after 25 years yes you're very right in 2008 i transitioned on to the airbus uh, 330 mm -hmm. and uh, it was a totally glass cockpit fully computerized fly by wire though air india had received its first uh, airbus 320 in the year 1988 i think if i'm not mistaken mm -hmm. uh, but of course at that time i was flying the boeing 737 so i did not get an opportunity and later when i did get the opportunity i chose to fly the bigger airbus 300 because i knew and that was my dream you know to always fly the biggest aircraft of indian airlines uh, which i flew in the year 1997 so going onward i think it's been uh, uh, it's been a little bit of a roller coaster when it came on to a full glass cockpit because the route suddenly changed the weather mm -hmm. phenomenon changed because we were doing long range flying from a three man crew on the airbus 300 we came on to a two man crew two persons in the cockpit only there was no flight engineer so a lot of new learnings but yeah. we adapted Yes, and like what Charles Darwin said, you know, you have to adapt to change. Okay. So it's not the yes, it's not the strongest or the most intelligent, but one who can change. So we have to change in our profession very fast. Interesting. Interesting. One of the things that you mentioned was about the multi-crew uh, license that you have, and yeah. I've heard some of the other pilot friends also talking about it, about the whole debate between commercial pilot license and a multi-crew. Where do you stand in this? Because some of the countries, they have started recognizing uh, a multi-crew license, isn't it? Uh, what do you think about Should India also yeah. change? Yeah, I, I think sooner or sooner than later, India will have to be on par in every sort of way with its international counterparts, be it the flying schools, flying clubs, or airlines. I still, I'm not very sure what it means to have a multi-crew pilot's license because mm -hmm. we don't have that concept in India. That's Yet right. we have multi-crew operations. Mm -hmm. So enhanced cockpit crew, you know, so which means that we have instead of two, we have either three or four, depending on the flight time that mm -hmm. we are flying. But I think, yes, going forward, we have to adhere to the international norms, you know, whatever IKO or IATA mandates, mm -hmm. we will have to definitely go by what they say. Sure. Um, <laughs> going back in the years a little, you know, when you started off, uh, because I'm sure as much as uh, it was a novelty to so see a woman pilot in 1984, I think before that, when you joined us uh, flying school, that time also it would have been something new for everyone. So uh, how was it uh, initially, you know, uh, because one of the questions that uh, I've been asked and, you know, uh, one of my friends also has asked is about how has it changed for a woman pilot in all these years? Um, uh, has, you know, uh, say, uh, how do the, your male counterparts receive a woman pilot when you had joined then? And have you 
seen a change now? Or how, how, how have things I think been? I think things have just become easier. Things have mm -hmm. become better. Girls are slipping into this role now. And I should actually say thanks to the initial pilots who flew. And I think it was very important for people like us to set a standard. You know, when we started flying, there were no terms like benchmarking or uh, data driven or, yeah. you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, reaching a logical conclusion structured. But yet we were doing the same things. Yeah. Now these are new terms that are just, you know, it's like new wine in an old bottle. You know, <laughs> it's like that. So we were doing what we had to do. Without knowing the big terms, we were doing it in all our simplicity on small aircraft. And we knew that people like us, we knew that we had a certain commitment we had to look after and protect the future of women who were going to come in. That's because true. we knew that we were the first one, two and three women who were flying. And yes, when I joined the flying school, of course, I was born and raised in Delhi. So, you know, Delhi being Delhi, <laughs> it was absolutely fine. It was beautiful. I joined the gliding club when I was only 15 years old. I was oh. welcomed over there. And I was, of course, treated like a princess, I, I should say, yeah. really. And now also after so many, after 42 years, I'm still in contact with my gliding friends. And they will just give me a call. And it's just like, you know, a close friendship. And then I joined the flying club, which was also good. Mm -hmm. Of course, initially when I went there, uh, the clerk and, you know, the staff, admonished me and said, no, no, you're too young and please go home and study. And this is not the time and age for you to come here. And that makes you, you know, more determined yeah, no, no. to do yeah, something yeah. because when you're set out at such a young age, when you set out to do something and if somebody tells you, you can't do it, it just, you know, All the more increases. Yes, it increases your determination to do it. But thereafter, of course, due to financial constraints, when I could not complete my flying in Delhi and I had to look for a scholarship. Mm -hmm. So my parents, uh, as they belong to Bihar, Patna and Ara, my mother's from Patna and my father's from Ara. So mm -hmm. we applied for a Bihar government scholarship because we are domiciled in Bihar. Mm -hmm. And there I got, I got a scholarship. I went there to uh, Patna to you know at, uh, appear for the entrance exam for the scholarship and I passed and I went there of course over there I think they did not really welcome me not because uh, being a woman more because I had come from Delhi uh -huh. and you know being <laughs> yeah. young yeah, yeah being young and being a little you know uh, headstrong and you know saying that yes I'm going to do things my way that did not help much I was not tactful. I was very mm -hmm. naive. I just wanted to do it my way and that did not help. And there were many, many, many instances where it was very tough for me. In fact, uh, when my mother and sister came to meet me after a year, I was almost ready to go back home with them. But I knew that if not now, I can never finish. I can never, you know, uh, complete uh, my flying and never fulfill my dream, which I had always dreamt to be an airline pilot. So life was very tough, I would say. In simple words, it was very, very tough. Initially in the flying school, yes. Mm -hmm. But after that in the airline, it was a mixed bag. Like I would say, you know, maybe 10, 15% were not for people like us, but that mm -hmm. was not because, uh, yeah, because they thought that, you know, we were coming and taking their place in the cockpit. And I mean, they thought that we were not required. Mm -hmm. That's what they thought. So for them, it was like, you know, what the heck, I mean, not required. I mean, we are there to do whatever has to be done. So yeah. come on, you know, I mean, let this domain be ours. Mm. But over a period of time, and you know, especially when I see my daughter, she just slipped into the role and they're very comfortable, their body language, they're flying, they're wearing their uniform, you know, everything is like natural, but we had to, you know, do everything with a purpose, mm -hmm. with, you know, uh, to show the world that we could do it as well as our men, male counterparts. Fantastic. Uh, at this point, I should tell our viewers that uh, Captain Basin comes from a family which is, uh, I think, one of the rarest of the kind because they're full of pilots. Uh, she's married to uh, a pilot. Her, both her children, daughter and son are pilots. Uh, who are married to pilots? Am I right? 
Oh, one, my daughter is married to a pilot. Daughter is married to a pilot. Yeah. So, so we have five pilots in the family. Am I right? <laughs> oh, one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> I've lost count actually. I think five, yeah, five. And I remember you talking about your father-in-law was also in aviation. Yeah, of course, of course. He His license was number seven and he was oh. uh, one of the best pilots and the best human beings anybody could ever know, Captain Jaydev Haseen. And he was uh, based, he was with Indian Airlines. And so I joined Indian Airlines. And when I came to Calcutta, that was my first uh, base. Uh -huh. They just treated me like the daughter-in-law. I was the daughter-in-law of the <laughs> Calcutta base. That was such a lovely feeling, you know, and they all called me, you know, the daughter-in-law, you know, so. Great. It was beautiful. And he retired in the year 1986 from the Airbus yeah. 300. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, you, uh, when you talked about the challenges, how about in the work uh, workplace also you talked about, but one more thing I want to ask was, how about things like maternity leave? Uh, you know, uh, was, was that always there when you joined or was it something that evolved uh, in, in airlines later on? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, uh, Prince, what happened was that when I joined the airline, I was very young. I had just turned uh, 21. I had just, uh, in fact, before I turned 21, I got the letter of appointment to join the airline. I just turned 21. And of course, by then I had met Captain Durba Banerjee, who was the first woman pilot of Indian Airlines. I had met Captain Sadamli Deshmukh, who was the second woman uh, captain. And I noticed that none of them had got married. Of course, that was their choice. And that was, yeah. yes, that was their choice that they made. So I just had this uh, in me that, yes, though I do wish to fly for the airline, I will only join Indian Airlines and I will always have a family and I always look forward to that because that was what my young mind wanted. Mm -hmm. You know, not that I was uh, in competition with anybody or it was a matter of pride or any such thing, but that's what I wanted. And when I joined the airline in 84, I started flying. And of course there was no maternity policy because there was no other mm -hmm. woman pilot who was married. So there was that's no right. question of having a maternity policy. And I was flying the Boeing 737 at that point of time in the year 1987 already, I think in my third, fourth month of pregnancy, all, already flying, you know. Wow. And yes, and then my instructor met us once in Calcutta, Captain HR Singh, and he asked, and we confided to him, my husband and I still remember at the Oberoi Grand Hotel, we met him. And uh, so uh, we confided and he said, oh, no, you know, you must stop flying immediately because not not that you can't fly. But mm -hmm. I think just to protect yourself and to keep the baby safe, I think it's very important what happens in case of an emergency. You know, if mm -hmm. you have to evacuate or if you have to jump or if there's a fire or something happens. And so immediately I informed the company doctor and then I took leave. We found out from the various companies and we I was a member of two of the best uh, association of women pilots and we saw that each airline had a different maternity policy so some allowed the uh, woman pilot to fly in the second trimester they allowed her to fly some did not allow some flew till the last month and it carries on like this till today so Indian nice. Airlines of course formulated a maternity policy for me and that was the first time we ever had a maternity policy. So in fact, earlier, and see, again, you know, when it comes to setting a standard benchmarking, we didn't know the meaning, but mm -hmm. because we were so conscientious and we got leave, we were allowed to join work six weeks mm -hmm. after giving birth. And on the 42nd mm -hmm. day, I reported for duty after both my children were born, after each one of them. And that was my level of dedication, you know, which I think I'm quite proud to say today that that was what I did, but not that it was a sacrifice, but just so that the airline would not ever question mm -hmm. our being pilots, our being in the cockpit. And they would always say that, yes, even though uh, a woman is there, yes, she comes back, you know, after maternity leave on time, she mm -hmm. is responsible, she's conscientious, She's good at her work. So that was what we did. That's you know, the, yeah. That's fantastic. Uh, 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 by 2005, you had so many private airlines coming in, in the sense you had the, uh, <coughs> many of them are not there right now, got grounded. But my question is that you were there in Air India, Indian Airlines, Air India for 37 years. Uh, 
Never thought of crossing over to the private islands? <laughs> <laughs> yes, the bug did bite me and it bit me quite hard. And this was, I think, uh, in the year 1996 or something like that. I think when East West, the Mania, yes, all right. these jet airways had just come in. And like my uh, batchmates and my colleagues, you know, everybody, you know, set out. Mm -hmm. you know, to tread the golden path <laughs> or to fly the golden wing. And I was left behind and even I wanted to go. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was just short, shy of applying, but my father-in-law, my husband's father stopped me. I and see. he said, never make that mistake of leaving your job that you have, which is a certain job, there's a security in it, don't leave it. So that was the one time I wanted to leave and he stopped me. And the second time where I wanted to leave, my children stopped me, but that was not, for private airlines but that was just that i wanted to quit because just thought i was overwhelmed with the two of them and there was too much happening and you know too many responsibilities and that's the time when they stopped me and after that i never looked back Fantastic. there was never a doubt if i could ask the airline that you're about to join does it <laughs> continue to fly today <laughs> no no it doesn't it? yeah the mania that was the, L, the mania yeah that was it and you know it was just it's just like you know you get enamored you feel enamored, you want to, you know, something, you know, attracts you, mm -hmm. whether it's money or, you know, some kind of something different, That's you true. always want. And, you know, sometimes you do feel, I'm mean, not always, I wouldn't say always, sometimes you do feel the grass on the other side is greener, but I've realized, no, very nice you, know, I'm, you have to be very satisfied with what you have. You have to know what you want. You have to be contented. And that's how I feel today, really contented at the end of 37 and a half years almost. And I thought I would be really, you know, not knowing what to do mm -hmm. in my you know, retirement time. But so far, so good. I'm holding on and I do not wish to jump into anything new in the near future. <laughs> That's fantastic. One of the questions that uh, uh, is asked, been asked, is a very interesting one um, because 9 11 changed a lot of things. I mean, it's not just about uh, uh, political strat uh, you know, strategies, political, uh, uh, but also the way uh, airlines flew in terms of safety and things like that. And I believe earlier you would have uh, passengers coming into the cockpit. Was that a very frequent thing? All the time. All the time. All the time. Yes. How did 9-11 change everything, the way you flew? Yeah, You know, when we were flying the smaller aircraft and when mm -hmm. Indian Airlines was the only airline, domestic airline in India, and it was either Air India or Indian Airlines, all the, all the, you know, at that point of time, mostly film stars were flying. So, <laughs> or, and, you know, Jaipur, Jodhpur, Udaipur, these were hot destinations for film shooting. So they would fly with Tabassum, I can remember, you know, Vijayendra Ghatke and... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Zarina Wahab, nice and you know, they would fly with us, and Zarina uh, Farooq, uh, Zarina Farooq Sheikh, yes, and they would fly to Cochin and all the time. And they would always come and they would hear us and they would say, just say, tell the captain I want to come, and we would call them and they would sit. And nice. they would sit in the cockpit through the landing, you know, <laughs> and we would like it, and they, we would just be chatting. But 9 11 changed the whole script. I, I remember I was flying on that particular day and I was on the Airbus 300 wow. on the 11th of September, taking off from Hyderabad, going to Sharjah. It was, I think, some Hyderabad, Bangalore, Bangalore, Sharjah. And at one stop on the TV in the dispatch, because we could always go to the dispatch in between. We had an hour and a half. On one thing, I heard about the first uh, crash, crash. And on the second stop, I saw it live. I mean, it was horrifying what we saw. Wow. And then, and then, you know, everything changed. We got our doors, which were, you know, reinforced doors. Everything, you know, became uh, silent, very stringent and strict. And suddenly life became like from fun. It became matter of fact. Mm. The fun was taken away and we were scared also we were scared because we didn't know what to expect next the security was very very tough and it just took longer for everything to happen and everybody was in kind of a tizzy you know to ex to expect the unexpected so life changed in a lot of ways for us uh, i think some of the things were okay because i mean uh, uh it was okay that you uh, were not disturbed by passengers all the time, right? I mean, that would have been one of the good things to have happened there. 
I, I think we enjoyed it over a period of time. Okay. All, of, all of us, yes. I think uh, I, I should not, uh, you know, be coy about it. I think we all sure. enjoyed it. We all enjoyed it because we had a, you know, regular, uh, you know, guests who flew yes. with us. We enjoyed their company. They enjoyed talking to us. We enjoyed showing them the sites. And it was like a show biz, you know, a little bit. But then everything became quiet. And uh, yeah, but then that also I say, you know, we had to adapt. So we adapted to the new way. Yeah. And now, of course, that's a way of life. Yeah, I know. I mean, personally, I would have loved to sit in a cockpit and feel the experience, the landing and the takeoff. But well, um, uh, was that the only change or did it change the way you trained also uh, in, the, in terms of safety, in terms of equipment you used to have, the technology that uh, flying uh, used to have was there changes were there changes in that too you know of, of course earlier everything was skill based everything mm -hmm. i mean i would say till maybe the 2000 you know maybe till the turn of the century so till 2000 everything was skill based and then now everything becomes evidence based so you know whatever we are doing we are showing and of course 2000 i'm talking about 2000 now we talk about 2020 so evidence based mm -hmm training is the new way forward many airlines have already uh, got it across uh, you know the world india mm -hmm. is still now at the moment as we speak it's going to be coming in so it talks about competencies what is a competency something that you cannot really measure mm -hmm. and something which cannot be seen but if you have a given standard then you can check it so if if i just talk about you know serial wise application of knowledge communication flight path management automated flight flight path management manual flight uh, skills then you have a workload management situational awareness procedures and comp uh, you know uh, procedures then we have a leadership and uh, problem solving so there are so many the nine competencies that will be checked so initially it was very simple chalk and talk you know the instructor would uh, write things on a whiteboard or mostly it was a whiteboard we didn't have blackboards of course uh, whiteboards so he would write and he would show you what we are going to do thereafter everything was on the computers you know so one computer is showing you what you're going to do what are the failures how we're going to do it in the simulator initially when i flew we had no simulator for the Fokker friendship Wow. F-27 that I flew. So it was an IPT, which is called the Intermediary Procedure Trainer. We just learned our procedures and then we went on to the aircraft straight away. We did some uh, flying mm -hmm. uh, over an airport like Calcutta Airport. We did some general flying. We got a hand into it and we started flying. Wow. And on the 737, we had a uh, simulator. So onwards from the 737, we had a simulator. But on the Fokker Friendship, we do not have a simulator. Now it's so advanced with mm -hmm. level D simulators, six axis, that you, straight from the simulator, you fly a plane. It is no different. Wow. It is so advanced. Wow. Uh, I had a personal experience uh, sitting in a simulator. And I must say, uh, I was glad that, you know, in the sense, I didn't think I, I, multiple attempts, but I didn't have one single perfect landing or takeoff. So uh, I had a natural gift for not flying. So <laughs> <laughs> we're glad you are here behind the camera. Yes, you know? yes. completely. <laughs> uh, uh, one of the things also we want to understand, and you were the chief of flight safety. Uh, what do things like, uh, and I've heard you talk about, you also had some experience of, you know, uh, while during a flight, having close brushes in terms of having technical problem in the, during the flight. Uh, how did things change for pilot when, uh, when, you, uh, when things like the crashes of the 737 MAX or, you know, we also had the episode in uh, Koriko last year when Air Index was crashed. Uh, do you think, uh, from a pilot's point of view, uh, uh, what, how do you uh, look at the safety aspect of the airports? Are we well equipped? Uh, the investigations that we have, are they fair and fine? Do you think we are able to look at the pinpoint at the uh, uh, shortcomings that we have? From a pilot's point of view, what, what is your view? I should just smile and say less is more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but you know, a lot needs to be done. Mm. A lot needs to be done. Our airports are pretty well equipped, I must say. Very well equipped. Mm -hmm. And we have the best of facilities. 
Yes, with modern airliners, we can land with almost zero visibility. We are flying the best equipment. We have very good instructors, but what is required is again, a better structure. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we talk about three Ps, policies, procedures, and processes. So if these three Ps are taken care of in an organization, everything will work well. But sometimes it doesn't happen like that, you know, because especially with safety, you know, safety being what it is, safety is like a big umbrella, it's like a big net under which all the departments fall. You okay. know, so whether it's whether it's yeah, cargo, whether it's ground handling, whether it's uh, uh, operations or uh, dispatch or commercial or engineering, everybody has to fall under flight safety. And then flight safety with training and with operations has to work together. So it's like three sides of a triangle. Everybody has to work in unison. Everybody has to work together. Sometimes they may not be that, you know, the sink, it may, it may be out of sync. Mm -hmm. For example, you know, safety may ask, put a certain recommendation. It may take time to be implemented. Training may take some time. They may have their different opinions. Operations may have a different viewpoint. Mm -hmm. So sometimes things do not gel and things do not, I mean, it takes time because Yes, you want to change certain things, but sometimes that change takes a long time. So, yeah. you know, in yeah, in some airlines, you will find that the processes are much far better than in other airlines. Mm -hmm. And that is because the research has been done. They have big, you know, departments, they big meaning not in terms of manpower, big in terms of research. The research has to be done so well that they uh, make the processes so good that, you know, everything flows smoothly the information you know especially in safety the safety management system how is it what is the safety culture we talk about a just culture is it really just is it really just we know that it cannot always be just and mm -hmm. you know where the human factor comes in where the human intervention comes in yeah. if it's a machine we know the machine is going to behave in this particular fashion only but when the human intervention comes in there are so many things that can happen you know flight data monitoring we talk about yeah foca flight operations quality assurance we talk about mm -hmm. so there are many aspects to flight safety not only just monitoring something and giving an instruction to somebody to do do things in a particular way mm -hmm. a lot needs to be done our airports are fantastic they are growing uh but the only thing is that in certain conditions, so it could be like a wet runway, and but even even that even that is now being looked after very well because last year this year I was mm -hmm. pleasantly surprised by Bombay Airport taking a lot of initiative, you know, in stopping flying and closing the airport and you know giving minute by minute updates on the weather. So we are moving forward. It's it's going to be slow. It's going to take a lot of time, but we are we are moving there. Airplanes are fantastic. Airplanes can deliver, but the training also has to be updated. So with the new card, the DGCA is now coming in on evidence-based training. So you know, uh, we talked about a startle. So when the COVID hit us mm -hmm. last year by March, it was like a startle event. Nobody knew what That's to expect. Right. There was no script written for it. We didn't know how to act. I mean, we all were shell shocked. We had to shut shop. We were all sitting at home. So it was like a startle effect. What happens in a startle effect? Mm -hmm. So uh, we are taught. So upset prevention and recovery training. So what is that? You are taught how to behave and for the emotions not to overpower your uh, thinking. So it teaches you, it teaches you the procedures to be followed in terms of expecting the worst and how to correct those things. So I think training has a lot to do with safety in flight. Interesting. Um, you talked about COVID and uh, one of our viewers, viewers Siddhant, uh, he also wants to know, uh, how was it during COVID, especially in the initial days and then uh, Air India also was very active in the whole Vande Bharat uh, mission. Uh, how was flying, uh, and you are a family full of pilots, I mean, uh, uh, so uh, what kind of challenge was it uh, physically, psychologically, mentally, uh, how did you overcome it, what was the experience flying in, at the same time, I, 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 uh, a number of flying hours would have come down, but at the same time, when you do fly, it would have been a challenging uh, affair. Yeah, so there are two parts to this, uh, Prince, so one was last year, Mm -hmm. when we when COVID hit us and one was this year a world of a difference the same COVID COVID 1.0 COVID mm -hmm. 2.0 mm -hmm. so COVID 
we started flying. We wasted no time. Our offices were continuously functioning. Our phones were buzzing. We were working from home. Immediately, mm -hmm. we changed our style of working, you know, adapt. So we adapted, you know, as pilots, we always have a plan A, plan B, plan C most of the time. So we adapted to change. We started working from home. We got ourselves organized. And at that point of time, I think we did not know what to expect. So we all flew, all of us. I went to Guangzhou, I went to Hong Kong, I went to uh, Shanghai. We went to all the places. We didn't care actually. We didn't think about what it meant in terms of being how serious it was. Mm -hmm. And when we went to places like Hong Kong or Guangzhou, where we were in the thick of uh, uh, the COVID at yes. that point of time, we flew with a full, you know, PPEs, you know, starting from a cap, a PPE and, you know, glasses and gloves and foot covers. And it was actually very difficult to fly because we were not used to it. A simple thing like, you know, when a person turns 40 and above, mm -hmm. you know, you need glasses to That's see. Right. So how long does it take to get used to those glasses? Quite a long time. Mm. But we were not given any time. Overnight, we had to change. We had to fly with gloves. So the feel changes when you're, you know, yeah. there are touch screens. Some things may work. Some things may not work. You know, you feel warm. You feel claustrophobic. You have shoe covers. The shoe covers, the, the shoes are, you know, slipping on the rudder pedals. So yes ergonomically human factors wise there was a lot of trouble mm -hmm. we overcome that yet we flew we didn't know the perils and actually we took pride in flying and we for, flew back uh, tons and tons of cargo of pp of yeah. uh, you know medical aid yeah. thereafter was came and and then there was a period which was very very worrisome because our pilots were losing their recency of flying mm -hmm. they were becoming very slow Mm -hmm. and uh, all kinds of things were happening and we saw that yes there was a certain rise in the number of uh, exceedances not incidents exceedances that were happening because uh, exigencies and no no exceedances meaning uh, the speed is high or they've okay. busted a level because the reaction time is more you know mm -hmm. the reactions are getting slower you forget how much can you practice sitting at home you cannot do armchair flying sitting at home the whole day That's yes true. before a simulator we all do it but if you haven't flown in one and a half months and you are only no. flying once a month or once in two months your reflexes will become quite slow so we saw a lot of that then came the second covid mm -hmm. When COVID hit us for the second time, at that point of time, it was very sad because we lost a lot of our crew, cabin crew, pilots, engineers, security staff, because that was the time. And we were always frontline workers. Yeah. But the vaccination came late. We were not given. We were like every other citizen, every other person in April was the first time we could ever get our vac vaccinations. Wow. And that actually was very sad. And, you know, I really feel that I wish our government or somebody had done something for us because actually we were frontline workers. Yeah, there was a quite a demand from everyone that you be declared as a frontline worker and be given vaccination on priority. Yeah, that didn't happen, which is yeah. Sad. So so that didn't happen for whatever reasons, you know, maybe maybe it was not thought uh, in the proper context or maybe you know it, it should have come from some other agencies not only our airline but we did suffer a lot and it was a terrible time because our phones were buzzing somebody wanted oxygen somebody wanted plasma somebody wanted admission into a hospital so you know flight safety on one side sickness on one side something else on the other side the phones never right. stopped buzzing at all and we were all going crazy not knowing people but just helping as many and as much as we could that was a very tough period. March, April, May of this year was the toughest in my career, I would say. Yeah, I must say. And saddest. Really, yeah, it was very similar experience for a lot of people. Uh, and I remember you telling, saying in one interview that you even had an oxygen cylinder always parked in your car, unless someone needs it. I still have it. I still, still have it. it. Yes, it's brand new. It's not open. I still, I don't know where you got all this information from. <laughs> yes, but I, I still have it because I was paranoid. I was so scared. I, I have an old mother. I have a mother-in-law yeah. and I didn't want any of them to suffer, you know, so I bought it and it just stays there. At one point of time, I thought I would give it away, but it, the, it, the scare really hits you. So, you know, you don't want to be stuck in that situation, but I think all of us, okay. all 
all our families have been afflicted by you know some cases my own everybody's family so it was very sad family friends we lost yes and we still don't know what's going to happen you know we are still waiting with bated breath oh yes covid yeah. 3.0 yeah yes true and it has kind of devastated the industry quite a bit i mean uh, from a from a case where pilots used to be scarce uh, and a very precious commodity now um, and i've heard it from many pilot friends also they struggle in meeting costs because they have run high emis because learning getting a license is an expensive affair and then you have all the emis to pay for and suddenly your earnings are gone so but i'm glad that now you have few uh, you know as we talk about revival of jet airways there's another new airline talk is happening akasa uh, so uh, it, it's quite a different uh, scenario for pilots today isn't it in way say about 5 years ago not as yet actually it's not started improving at all i mean you know so if if you are still a fledgling pilot if you've taken loans if you still just got your leg in the door you're in a pretty bad scenario a girl just sent me a message two days back she had joined after almost 3 or 4 years of struggle and now with covid she's gone back to the place where she was you know two years she's not flown at all and now you know it's difficult to perform because it's natural that if you haven't flown for two years your performance is going to really fall sharply That's so for people like her it's very very difficult of course for the others yes we may say that something is bright is coming up but how far is it true whether jet 2.0 will right. is a reality whether it is just to get the maxes out and flying for some time we don't know what is the agenda we don't know but i only wish that you know the lives of the pilots are not played along with because right. they really have worked hard to get their licenses it's not easy to keep a license current that's true that's true one question from surendra my colleague he asks how has privatization of airports uh, i mean what has that done to the industry uh, because things have really changed isn't it from say about 10 15 20 years ago the way the, the airports we have uh, how do you see that development i mean in the sense the whole progress we have we have one of the best airports in the world now yeah i mean look at delhi look at bombay yeah. amazing i mean we have flown to airports you know uh, which <laughs> were hardly airports which is just sheds That's so true. tezu tezu was the north eastern most airport in india mm -hmm. i don't think many people have heard about tezu That's tezu right. was the place where we used to fly once a week on every monday on a fokker friendship so we were based in calcutta and we would fly along the river brahmaputra north yeah. bank south bank north bank south bank tezpur lilabari jorhat mohanbari and then reach tezu tezu was a grass a uh, grass trip on psp sheets you know wow. those uh, <laughs> sheets with holes and a grass trip that's how i mean that's how life has evolved for us and now when we see mumbai airport or we see delhi airport fantastic i mean what else can we see it's state of the art even a small airport like gondia which mm -hmm. i visited in the year 2009 everything was ready air conditioners the arrival hall it's not been used of course as of mm -hmm. now i think but mm -hmm. i'm sure with the you know rcs and uran coming up i'm sure it will be revived so i think a lot of people have got jobs which is fantastic mm -hmm. uh, airport authority of india is doing very well the private players are doing excellent and i think there's an accountability That's but right. it's become expensive but no doubt yes. but i think people can afford it yes people are willing to afford it so if they can afford it why not i think the whole re realization that you really save a lot of time and nowadays time is a scarce commodity that has led to a lot of people flying uh, two people have asked me a very similar question raghav and uh, amin again which are your favorite aircraft and which are the <laughs> routes or the cities that you have loved visiting on flying yeah so a uh, very very simple answer i don't have to think <laughs> i can close my eyes and i can just say the 737 the uh -huh. boeing 737 because i got my first command on that as an airline pilot i loved it i still love it 
I mean, it's a beautiful, small aircraft. We could do anything on it. And it was actually hands flying. You know, hand flying is when you can actually fly the plane. The bigger the plane, the less hand flying, the less manual flying we do. And we're not supposed to do manual flying on big airplanes. Yeah. So plane wise, yes, Boeing 737, it had beautiful, you know, eyebrow windows where you, you could do yeah. small, short, <laughs> short circuits, short circuits at 500 feet above sea level. We would go from Bombay to Cochin and do a 500 feet circuit all the time. And we would go from Bombay to Aurangabad and you know, 40 miles, we would say field and site. We had nothing, but we knew exactly in the bend of the river, we knew that this was the point where we had to turn right and silcher. We would tune on to our All India radio stations and that was the way we flew. So wow. 737 hands down. And of course now, uh, since I've been flying the 787 since 2000 and uh, uh, which year was that? 2012, I love mm -hmm. that also. And yeah. airport and the country city. Yeah. is, yeah, airport, city, country, it's very odd. Maybe nobody else thinks about that. I love Tokyo. I, I love Tokyo. I love Tokyo because I love the resilience of the Japanese. I love their uh, outdoors. I love Mount, I'm a trekker, so I've climbed Mount Fuji. I love their food, though I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> I do a lot of uh, traveling, sampling. And I love everything Japanese, you know, the way they are, the way, uh, you know, after the tsunami hit them, they rebuilt mm -hmm. everything. They stood in line. They did not, uh, you know, uh, go stealing things from any place. I think, and, uh, you know, reading about uh, the dog Hachiko, if you've uh, uh, seen the this. Movie. Yeah. Seen so it. I think, yeah, so I think yeah. Tokyo, Narita Airport, and yeah. uh, Japan in particular. And I would wish, I wish I can visit Japan very soon. <laughs> now, uh, one question, and I think that's really is a good one to kind of sum up our evening. Neha asks, what are your plans for the next leg of the journey? I mean, can you ever stop <laughs> flying? Can a pilot ever stop flying? <laughs> flying on ground? We are always flying on ground. So, well, we can never stop flying. But uh, I, I think uh, Neha, uh, to answer you, and I know who you are, Neha, so it's okay. <laughs> Uh, you know what my dream is? My dream is now I've flown since 1979, which means 43 years already, wow. whether it's a glider or with it. And I think I will fly till at least 50 years. So, <laughs> so I think I have to do how many more years? Seven more years I have to do in whichever aircraft. So whether it's a spacecraft, whether it's a rocket or whether it's a glider or a small plane, yes, I will fly definitely. Flying as an airline pilot, I'm not so sure. Mm -hmm. Because I've done that, I've been there, I've done that, and uh, uh, flying full time maybe not, but definitely something really nice to keep me busy, to keep me challenged. You know, I mean, I would definitely give my time mm -hmm. if I find a place and environment that I really love. I would certainly do something. Lots. Interesting. Surinda asked one more question. He says, "Have you ever gifted a flight simulator to kids in your family?" No, uh, actually, uh, uh, yes and no. So, you know, in the airline, it was very difficult to get uh, outside people in to fly the simulator. Mm -hmm. But yes, in the year 2013, we had organized a Women of Worldwide Awareness Week. And we gave joy rides to children in the simulator at the Delhi uh, Flying Club. Nice. So th that was one time. And this year, of course, I will let you know that this year, if anybody needs my time, I'm making the public uh, announcement today uh -huh. of course my friends know it but uh -huh. now more people will know about it if anybody needs my time this year till 31st december i am willing to pay it forward my time is anybody's time if they want it at schools and anybody for whatever reason and I'll, I'll be very happy to share my time effort explaining things inspiring anybody you know so that's what I look forward to. Wow, that's fantastic. I think anyone hearing, and I think we will make best that this much message goes across to as many people as possible. I think that's something that people should jump onto and really make use of your uh, experience. Uh, one thing I actually want to ask, and one of the viewers also had uh, actually put that question. Um, and I think this is something that in each profession we uh, really uh, face, and that's about fitness. You know, uh, uh, especially for a pilot, when and you talked about your flying hours and the kind of schedule you have, how do you keep uh, track of your fitness? Swimming. Swimming, I see. 
five days a week, six days a week, not seven, but six days a week, because that's what I've been doing since I learned how to swim. I learned how to swim very late in my uh, husband's family. Everybody's a swimmer. Nice. My son learned how to swim when he was three. And when it was time for my daughter to learn how to swim, I got into the pool myself. So I think at 31 or 32, I learned how to swim and I've never looked back. But because of COVID, we had to stop. There was no way that we could. But now again, the pools have opened up. Swimming is one of the best exercises. Walking is second best for me. And if I don't get to swim, I will just go now after our talk. I will go for a very, very fast, swift walk. Yoga. I've done yoga for three years. I learned Iyengar yoga. So I do whatever I can do, you know, given the time that I have. And I'm, I'm going to get back to my yoga now very shortly because I think with these three things and my cycling, my cycle, nice. uh, which I love to ride and I can ride long distance, 50, 60 kilometers I can ride. So, Whoa. I mean, we have to be fit. So, it, you know, it's like, uh, again, three sides of a triangle one is your mm -hmm. career one is your home and one is your fitness that's right which one you have to give priority to at what point of time depends on what you need so it's very important to, but fitness is very important for a not only for a pilot i would say for anybody number mm -hmm. one is physical fitness number two is mental fitness because if you're not physically fit how can you be mentally you know good exactly. so i think it's very very important I agree but one question has slipped in and i'll just take it because it's interesting it so it's an anonymous person asks how do you see air india in the next five years i think it's very interesting because we also in the midst of privatization I, i'm sure that yeah, yeah. I mean, there's no way that you can comment on the privatization but how do you see the next five years for air india uh, i would say mixed back feelings of course mm -hmm. i'm no longer there but my son is still there yeah. and i'm happy to have you know resigned i mean sorry retired superannuated from air india because nice. I've been there all my life. We don't know what the future holds for us, but we can only hope that it will become better. Yes, That's all I hope and pray that it will only become better. And uh, see, we have the planes, we have the routes, we have the pilots. That's true. And if, you know, uh, like I said, the three Ps, policies, processes, and procedures. Mm. The three Ps, if somebody gets them going together in a good way, I think it'll just infuse new, uh, blood and new enthusiasm in the people because that's what is missing at the, at this point of time for many years actually it's been missing the enthusiasm the passion to go ahead i think it'll become better only i hope so i'm here i'm here to see what's happening and i do <laughs> hope and pray that things will become better yeah that's fantastic because i think it's uh, it still has a great brand recognition uh, i think that's really something that anyone would build on uh, a new owner or whoever yeah so, uh, on that note, uh, Captain, it was a pleasure uh, having you. Uh, I think you're 37 years. I think we wanted to ask more. One hour is not enough. Uh, but thank you so much for your time. And it was a pleasure hosting you. And I'm hoping that more and more people would use your time to know more about aviation and make use of your experience. So thank yeah. you so much. And, and thank you, viewers. An absolute pleasure to be here with you and thanks to all the viewers who joined in. I can see uh, quite a few have joined in and we do hope that when you put us up on uh, YouTube, Very we'll soon. have more inputs, we'll have more inputs. And this is what it is, you know, sharing your journey because uh, earlier I would not share much, but I do think that that's a responsibility we have to Generation Next. Uh, sometimes, you know, people are not so passionate and they need idols and mm -hmm. they need role models to that's follow. Right. Until the time they don't find role models, it's very difficult for them to carry on. So I think it's a, a moral a responsibility and obligation to Generation Next to share what we've gone through so that they are better prepared for the future. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Captain Basin. Uh, Have a thanks good a lot. Thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Pleasure being with you. Bye-bye.